The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans, High Stick NT, and the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Pro. We're here at Farm Smart, and I'm joined by Mr. Uh, Michael McNeil, who's a crop consultant um, from Iowa, 35 years experience, and uh, currently working in, with growers um, on about 165,000 acres. Welcome uh, north of the border, Michael. Thank you. I came up here to get warmed up. <laughs> Hey, you've uh, just had a, a, a full hour presentation focusing on optimizing profit in soybean production. Um, a lot of things we talked about. I want to highlight and focus on a few things here. So let's, let's start it off. Uh, your whole presentation really starts with the fact that you need good soil health. Correct. Soil health is vital to optimizing profits and growing any crop that we try to grow. Without good soil health, uh, we just have no chance. And a lot of the practices that we've been using in the past have degraded our soil health tremendously. So we need to do some soil health testing and we also need to uh, continue to do our, our chemical testing and looking at the physical properties of the soil. But soil health is our crucial issue that we must pay a lot more attention to. Now you talked about soil sampling was a, was a key for you, and uh, you like to sample by soil type or soil management region. Um, you don't like grid sampling. Uh, no, I have found that uh, sampling by soil type uh, is probably the best way to go, or a soil management region. If you're sampling with grids, uh, grids were developed because they're easy to work with, handy to put into your computer, but if you draw that square, out on a piece of soil. You may have a pH of 5.4 in part of that grid and 8.3 in another part of the grid, and you pull some subsamples out of that, mix them together in a sample, send it to the test lab, and you get a pH of seven, which says my soil is perfect. When in fact, part of it needs uh, remediation, a little more lime, and the other is way too high, it doesn't need anything. You also mentioned, you know, we seem to be fixated on N, P, and K. Um, but we really do need to do a better job focusing on micronutrients. That's true. We've spent the last 30, 40 years concentrating on N, P, K, testing and fertilizing, and it has done a remarkable job of improving yields all over the world. But it's done so at the expense of degrading soil organic matter, uh, degrading soil biological activity and soil aggregation. Now something that you really like to focus on is uh, percentage base saturation. I do. Uh, you know we look at, at mineral tests and we, we look at cation exchange capacity but percent base saturation, getting our bases in the right ratios is extremely important particularly the calcium, magnesium, potassium ratios extremely important. If they're right, our soil will be healthy, uh, mellow, uh, good gas exchange, we can get CO2 out of the soil, we can get oxygen into the soil, everything works well. So we need to start spending more time looking at percent base saturation. Let's move on to planting and you, you we talked a lot about that and uh, you know you you said you know growers really need to compromise here. Um, everybody wants to go early and wants to have that full length of season, but the bottom line is that you have to plant in the good conditions. If the soil is not ready for you to plant into, you can cut your yields 20 to 30 percent right off the top. That is huge cut. Uh, a good way to, uh, I always like for an easy way to explain, well when is the soil fit? And I take the soil and I I go down about two inches, that's about where we're going to be planting. Take the soil, make a ball, make a hard ball with my hand. Then I, I put it between my, my two fingers and my thumb. If I press on it, and I have a thumbprint in the ball, park the planter. If the ball all crumbles and falls on the ground, start planting. Planting depth, another thing you talked about. You know, there's always, it's a wide range of discussion and there's a lot of factors that, that impact it and whether you should be, you know, plan to get a, an inch and a quarter, an inch and three quarters, but one key thing that you said was, you know, seed to soil contact, and what you 
preached, avoid your pockets. The, it's extremely important to have good seed soil contact. And you think you have good down pressure on your planter, you have your press wheel set properly, but check it. A good easy way to check that is take a license plate or a piece of tin and slice down through just beside the row, pull the soil away from it, and just keep slicing and moving into that seed till you get right to where the seed is being placed. You can see the seed then lying in the soil. Is there air pockets around that seed or is the soil, soil touching the seed very tightly? If you have air pockets, you're gonna have germination problems, you're gonna have soil disease, plant disease issues, soil borne diseases will be a problem. Um, you've cut 20, 30 percent of your yield again, right there. That, that yield is slowly, slowly going away. Yeah, you notice we took a little away with yeah. plant health, we took a little away with our planting. We're eating away at the genetic potential that was in that seed when we planted it. Plant spacing. You mentioned that, you know, um, you know the space between plants, you, it's so important. You want to avoid clumps. I do. Um, Plant spacing, uh, whether you're drilling or row planting, uh, is extremely important. You don't need wide gaps between the plants, and you don't need the plants packed together. If you have four plants real close together, the center two plants are weeds, and they really detract from the production of all the plants around them. Scouting, you, uh, you mentioned growers don't do enough scouting. You really need to be in that field two to three days after planting. We need to spend a lot more time in our fields. And I realize that's hard to do. And I'd like to see you start observing that field two to three days after you've planted it. Many times we're all still planting. But you need to go back and look at that first field you planted two to three days later and, and check it. Things you're looking for are crusting, soil crusting, one thirty-second of an inch of crust will hold the CO2 in the soil and cause stunting of the plant. It will also cause uh, an increase in soil-borne diseases. Let's talk about um, you know, staying in that field the whole year long uh, throughout the growing season. You right. mentioned we should really have some type of a, a, a scouting schedule. Yes, set up a scouting schedule that uh, looks at when, when do you expect certain insects to arrive, when do you expect certain diseases to be more prevalent. Scout your fields about every five to seven days and take time to look at them. You know, spend some time. Uh, just driving by at 60 mile an hour won't do it. Uh, stop and look. It takes a while to really see what's going on. Two more things. First of all, you talked about mid-season nutrients, obviously, and, and looking for what you call the hidden hunger, um, and, and how things like a sap analysis can really help you out there. Yes, a lot of times you go out and you look at your field, looks pretty good. Green, it's uniform, beautiful. There's what I call hidden hunger. And the only way you can find that is do some chemistry testing. Now use a sap analysis uh, to check the sap of the plant. And that tells me a lot, because some minerals are very mobile in the plant, some are not mobile at all. So I sample a bottom leaf, and then I sample a fully mature top leaf, and I compare the results. And so if I have a lot of calcium in the bottom leaf, which is a very immobile element, and I look at the top leaf and there's very little calcium, I know we have a calcium deficiency. We can foliar feed and bring that back into proper uh, alignment. Uh, other minerals move very easily. For example, phosphorus moves pretty quickly in the plant. So nitrogen moves very quickly. So your bottom leaf may have no nitrogen at all. The top leaf has adequate nitrogen. Still, now you're, you're still short of nitrogen because you should have the same amount in both the bottom leaf and the top leaf. Final well, thing I want to talk about, and that you just mentioned, foliar, uh, foliar um, fertilizer and foliar feeding. Um, you mentioned, you know, and you're a big proponent of that, and for you the key is really depending on the product you need, sorry, you're using, and making sure that you have the, the optimum time for applying that product. Exactly. Um, what I'm looking for is the point of deliquescence, 
and that is a, a, a the right temperature and humidity for the product that you're applying. Now an easy an easy rule of thumb is that generally occurs early in the morning or later in the evening. And that's the best times to apply foliar fertilizers. When I first started doing it, I was successful one year out of five. Now I'm successful every year. Once I learned, you put it on at the right time, it always works.